And the thing that was so neat is he came up here in July of 19 and spoke to us. As he was walking out, I was talking to him and he goes, you know, I've got a couple of more in my repertoire. And I go, really? I said, you'll have an email when you get back to your office with some dates on it. And by golly, he did another one in January of 2020. Well, as we got through the pandemic, I emailed again. And, you know, there was communication and a date tentatively set, but Dr. Prescott passed in late May. And instead of them saying, see you later, in the tradition they did in the past, they now brought us Dr. Judith James to come fill that spot. And it easily could have been, see you later, have a good day. Uh, that was one of Dr. Prescott's likes that in one of our likes. And I thought, it, I thought it was really, it meant a lot that they were able to do that. Uh, Dr. James is the Vice President of Clinical Affairs at OMRF. Her personal research is in understanding autoimmune diseases. She's a fifth generation Oklahoman from Pond Creek. And she brought with her a member of Club 29, Penny Voss, who she will talk a little bit about also. So Dr. James, come on up and thank you for doing this. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate that kind invitation. I also have my happy bucks because I've heard more laughter in this room and I've seen more faces without masks on than I have in I don't know how long. And so for that, I have two happy bucks. And so, um, so thank you very much for inviting me. And so I will talk a little bit about being from Pond Creek, but I actually have family here in Stillwater. So I was able to stop by at Gallagher Iba and see my nephew, who's a walk-on at the basketball team, uh, coaching a whole bunch of six to nine-year-olds. And so watching him corral all these little kids was actually a lot of fun. And then I'll get to see my brother and sister-in-law. My sister-in-law, I may be the only person who could come from OMRF and say that I'm actually the second person from my family who's spoken here uh, because she is Emily James and she came from Legacy and spoke to the Rotary. So thank you very much for having us. And so, but I'm very sad that I'm here because Dr. Prescott couldn't come in himself. And so we lost Dr. Prescott a few weeks ago, but he had invested 15 years at OMRF. I will tell you, but don't let this get around. I've actually been at OMRF 33 years. I tell people now I came as a very young child, right? Because I want people to think I'm young, if not fit, at least sort of young, right? And so I have been on campus. I came as an undergraduate student and have loved it and have never left. And so when they asked me to speak, I was planning on talking about arthritis because usually in a group this size, I can get a few people interested in my knee hurts, my hip hurts, my hands hurt. Um, but um, then they were saying, well, maybe this time you could talk a little bit about COVID. And so I'll talk a little bit about COVID, a little bit about OMRF, and then a little bit about what, um, what anything you wanna ask me, okay? And so I'm just gonna talk, I know most of us are sick and tired of hearing about COVID, right? But there's a lot of information coming out about variants and what do we need to know? What do we need to worry about? What can we not worry about? We'll talk a little bit about the vaccines and the vaccines of, and how rapidly they came out. And there's some great science about that. Um, but I'm not going to give you all those details. And then we'll talk a little bit about research that's actually happened here in Oklahoma, and then a little bit about uh, what's new that businesses need to know based upon the 954 page document that came out by OSHA last week. And I have it trickled down to two slides. Okay. And so... <laughs> So we have now had 400, over 450,000 cases of COVID in Oklahoma uh, with unfortunately over 7,000 deaths. And so we may uh, joke about the fact that we don't want to wear our masks anymore. And boy, is it hot when you have a mask on in Oklahoma in the summertime. Uh, but we did what we had to do to try and protect Oklahomans. And now we're doing much better. So I'm so happy to say that we used to have a seven-day rolling average in the 700s to 800s just in January of this year. And now we are down to last week having a rolling average of 14 new cases a day. Yes, I have to say, pretty happy about that. 
Um, we do still have about 100 patients that are hospitalized across the state, but that's down from when we used to have 22 to 2,400 patients a day that were in the hospital. And COVID has gone Greek. And so you can tell that I, I actually went to college in Oklahoma Baptist University because my sister was the state 4-H president. So of course she had to come to OSU and you know we'd spent our whole lives in the same school. So we had to go somewhere else. So I told my dad I was gonna go buy Stillwater which got me to Shawnee. He didn't like that joke any better because he's an OSU uh, alum. And so, uh, but COVID has gone Greek. And so alpha is what we used to call the UK variant. Uh, beta is the South African variant. Uh, gamma is the Brazilian variant. All three of those we're really not seeing a whole lot of. And then the one that everybody has been talking about is the variant that's been in India, which is the Delta variant. And it is more transmissible, meaning that it spreads to more people. Every infected person spreads it to more people. It can be more dangerous, but the good news is, is that our vaccines actually protect against it. And so, and that good news just came out in the last couple of weeks. And so all of you have heard about Operation Warp Speed. This was how we went from having the identification of a new virus we had never heard about to having a vaccine in less than a year, which is really, really unheard of. And most of us wonder how in the world uh, you scientists are always trying to tweak things. You're always trying to make things a little bit better. How could you ever have made something happen so quickly? And so part of it was because instead of going step, wait, step, wait, step, wait, we kind of did multiple things at once, right? And so this has been a real scientific, amazing thing. And now actually we have this technology that we can apply for other vaccinations and hopefully we'll be able to do this for other infections and make it much faster. And so, you know, we've had multiple different steps. So you have the research and the development, and then you have basically the testing and the manufacturing, all of those things were kind of happening and concurrently at the same time. And so in February, they asked me to give a talk at OMRF about vaccination. And so in February 25th, which believe it or not, is only about three, three and a half months ago, um, we had given 500,000 doses and 293,000 people were fully vaccinated. Um, and the amazing thing is that we got in a million Oklahomans to do the same thing in the last three months. And so now we're up to almost 1.4 million people. It's only 35% of Oklahoma, but remember a lot of our kids can't take the vaccine yet, right? And so we're getting closer to the 50% mark. And if you take people who are over 65, we're actually closer to 65, 68%. And so uh, we were in the top 10 for many months. We've kind of slipped down at the chart. Um, and basically uh, in Payne County, I had to look this up, is about 33% fully vaccinated as of last week. Uh, I made the reference Garfield County because Grant County, which is where Pond Creek is, is way worse. And so Garfield County is at 29% and Oklahoma County is at about 40, 42%. And so you can arrange a vaccine almost anywhere now. So you can get them at Walgreens or Walmart or CVS, or uh, you can contact your health department. They'll tell you all the places you can go. Uh, testing is much more difficult to find now, but I will tell you at the end, some grants that we have that are making uh, mobile testing where we see little outcroppings so that we can hopefully contain it and not have these big shutdowns again. And so uh, I was really excited about, so I'm an immunologist. Anybody know what an immunologist is? Yeah, so an immunologist is somebody who studies your immune system. Your immune system is your defense system, and it's supposed to protect you from all these different kinds of infections that come around. I'm also a rheumatologist, which means I see patients who have arthritis. Anybody here have a bad knee, bad hip, hands? Yep, yeah, it's because we got people in the room. <laughs> So yeah, you don't want more crappy dollars. I, that would be talking about lots of people wanting to have those. And so as an immunologist, we were very excited to get the vaccines and make them available. And so we know that if you make it easy um, and we wanted to give our vaccines on Friday so people would stay home on Saturday and Sunday when they felt sick instead of missing work. And so we brought them to OMRF. So we had vaccine clinics, not just for the employees, but also for our patients because our patients are at high risk because they have these diseases where your immune system is already too busy attacking yourself to be able to protect you against outside things. And so those are the types of arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis, 
um, diseases like multiple sclerosis with um, other things like lupus. And I'm happy to answer any questions about those if you have any at the end. And so OMRF, I don't have to tell you much about because you had Dr. Prescott come twice, right? But it's a private nonprofit research institute, which has actually been around. This is our 75th anniversary. And so my brother was like, yes, you've been there half their life, but you've been there way more than half your life. And so he also was happy to tell me the day that I turned middle age because, you know, to him, he's, he was born my senior year in high school. And so, and no matter how famous I get, I will never be as famous as him because he was the quarterback who took Pond Creek to back-to-back -back state championships, right, in football. And so, um, so he loves to give me a hard time, but we do have now about 730 employees. We have many, many students who come and work in our labs who are interested in careers in medicine, interested in careers in graduate school. I've actually had 151 kids now come through my personal lab and most of them have gone pro in something else and come back to practice in many of our communities. So we have programs in a lot of different areas. So the one that I'm the chairman of is arthritis and clinical immunology. We're the largest program. We have about 200 employees. We have 20 principal investigators. So that's people who are kind of small business owners, meaning that they employ people in their labs and they have to bring in the funds to support the people in their labs. And then we have this coalition kind of these different labs that are in different areas. Ours are in arthritis, clinical immunology, how the immune response works. And then we have others that are focused on cardiovascular biology, so heart stuff. We have others that are kind of focused more in um, aging and metabolism, which means diabetes and healthy aging and longevity and, and how can we live longer, healthier. And then we have another group that's really focused on cancer and really basic cells, how cells divide. And that's called cell cycle and cancer biology. And our mission has been ever since the inception is that more may live longer, healthier lives. And so what kind of research have we actually done in Oklahoma to try and help us through this pandemic? And so we helped develop a new way of testing that didn't use any of the same stuff that people were using all over the rest of the country because we have lots of pioneers and lots of innovators in Oklahoma. And the problem was, is that you couldn't get some of the stuff because it was being sucked up by New York and California. And so we found ways to use uh, microfluidics and um, different pieces that uh, were not supposed to be used for that and repurposed it. That allowed us to start a saliva testing program. So we actually brought people back to work faster at OMRF because every week you would spit in your Dixie cup and then take out a few drops of your spit and put it in a little tube. And then we could use the spit in that tube to see if people were infected. And we were able to identify people and send them home and keep everybody protected. And so they, we had very low cases of numbers of patients at OMRF, and we had no spread from an employee to other people. So, which was a, a great way, but we screen people every week. So we were doing 400-ish tests in our lab every week from about the end of October through the end of May. And now we've stopped that. Um, but I think it also made our employees feel much more comfortable, right? Because we're scientists. We were applying scientists, science to try and keep our science going. Um, we also formed something called the Oklahoma City Start Consortium, um, which actually had projects about um, how people, some people were getting the virus and were really kind of not having many problems with it at all. And so we would get blood from those individuals to try and understand how they responded differently than the people who ended up in the hospital. We also have focused on what things we could do like different kinds of UV exposure, different kinds of things to decrease the um, spread of COVID in rooms like this one. And so we also were interested in how much of this was running around the community before we knew about it. So we looked at healthcare workers and we'd take a drop of blood. And I have to say, I never dreamed there'd be this many people in the room. So if anybody's really excited about wanting to know whether or not you've made antibodies to this virus, I brought stuff so that I could test them. And so, uh, but we also are in, you know, but maybe that's just the science geek in me coming out, right? And so, but you just take two drops of blood. Yeah, you, you can. You don't see he, he's showing what I have hidden under the room. <laughs> and you take two drops. Of <laughs> no. 
And so, but we found that about three to 4% of Oklahomans had been exposed in March and April. And that we looked at healthcare workers by October, November, and this was October, November, and early December, we were up to about 10 to 14%. And um, now those numbers are, of course, much higher because of the vaccination rates. And we did this in partnership with the Oklahoma Blood Institute. So they were doing blood drives because the blood, um, we were really short on blood in the state. And this got people who were working in the hospitals coming to work anyway to give blood. And we could tell them what their antibodies were because many people wanted to know. And so we also enrolled people into cohorts. And so if you had been exposed, if you had been infected, we would have you come in, we would get information about what kind of symptoms you had, how well you responded, what was going on. And then we'd have them come back every three months to see how things changed over time. And now we're up to about 560 seven people um, and we could see how they responded and whether or not they made antibodies and how long those antibodies lasted. And so other departments worked on different pieces. So of course, we've had studies on trying to understand why some people have heart involvement, some people have lung involvement, some people um, now we're looking at the sequence of the different virus in different parts of the state to see what variants are coming up and making sure that we're really protected. And so most of you know that lots of the side effects of COVID can kind of hang on. So after you're infected, lots of people have fatigue while they're infected. And about 50% um, of people will still be fatigued, fatigued so much that they can't really do things for at least 30 days afterwards. And the joint pain also, which is one thing that rheumatologists take care of, is another really common effect that can last for more than 30 days. And so, and when you look at our patients, our patients have autoimmune diseases. Some of them get the virus and respond and clear it really quickly, but about half of them are still having symptoms that are keeping them from getting back to work as many as 30 days afterwards. And so we're working on trying to understand what that is and what we can do to try to help them so they can get back to work faster. And so I lead something called the Oklahoma Shared Clinical and Translational Resources which sounds like a weird, you know, made up thing. Um, and so it's called the OSCTR. And so we, because we love abbreviations in science and it's actually a consortium of 29 different institutions from across the state that's really focused on trying to build clinical research in the state to improve the health and health outcomes of all Oklahomans. And so Oklahoma State University is a partner in this and we have pilots that are here at OSU. Somebody said nutrition, we've given a pilot actually in the nutrition department. Um, actually we've given two pilots in the nutrition department. And then we also have a partnership with the OSU Med School in Tulsa. And then we also have um, different groups including OMRF which is one of the primary partners and I lead that initiative. And so one of the things we do is we have a consortium of 300 clinicians that cover 70 of the 77 counties in Oklahoma. And um, they were very interested, in, especially when testing was hard to find um, in being able to bring testing into clinics and into doctor's offices. And so we were able to write this grant to bring federal dollars in to increase community testing in um, throughout the whole state of Oklahoma instead of it mainly being in uh, bigger cities. We also did the same kind of thing with the Cherokee Nation. And so um, the Cherokee started a program called Cherokee Protect, um, which was to increase testing and to discuss vaccine and vaccine hesitancy and to try and improve um, the outcome because they were having a lot of severe um, patients and, and death in older patients in the Cherokee Nation. And so these are different studies that have actually brought money to the state of Oklahoma um, to work on different types of COVID research about the immune response, about the heart involvement, about improving testing and vaccination and vaccination responses. And so as well as clinical trials so that we could try and improve patients um, response if they did get infected. And so here's the promised two slides summarizing 954 pages. Okay. And so these, uh, so the good thing is how many people here work at a healthcare institution? Okay, you and I. So we have a whole different set of rules, and those rules are way more complicated. And so the good news for everybody else is that the healthcare places have different set of rules and they're way more complicated, right? Because we're trying to protect you if you come to those. For all, for everybody else in the businesses, um, OSHA has come up with recommendations, but not mandates. For us, they have mandates, right? 
there are no recommendations. And so these are many of these are what you think of as common sense, right? So um, patients need to have time off so they can get vaccinated. Patients, who, people who are infected um, or have symptoms need to stay home if they're sick or if they may be sick. Um, physical distancing, unvaccinated individuals at risk may need to have need to have face coverings actually provided, education trained workers, and then a lot of additional things. And so I also have this kind of summarized. So if anybody's interested, I'm happy to share that with, um, with you if you need this for your business. And so that kind of closes my talk. And so he's already stole my thunder about being from Pond Creek. And so you can all look at the Oklahoma map, see Stillwater, and uh, you'll notice that Pond Creek did not make this map. <clears throat> and that was a serious oversight. So I've made my own map, right? That has Pond Creek with a big star, right? So you can't miss Pond Creek anymore. And uh, I am a kid from a farm outside a town of less than a thousand people, right? Who, um, whenever I was, somebody was talking about, you know a lot whenever you're six, what you wanna do. Um, I think she was helping people and maybe talking about radio, right? I was playing doll hospital, stealing my sister's dolls and trying to give them medicine, right? Because I knew I wanted to be a physician. Um, and then I came to OMRF as a summer student because I wanted to get research experience um, because that would help me get into med school. And I was the Fleming Scholar, which is our summer program who basically never left. And I've been very fortunate to be able to start getting medicine, start getting money to help support research and to bring students into my group um, starting while I was in med school. And then that's increased over time. And that's increased to the point where now, thankfully, we're able to employ many, many people and we're bringing in, so Dr. Prescott had raised $100 million in philanthropy. And I'm very happy to say I have brought in $120 million worth of grant money to keep our kids in Oklahoma getting trained so that they can have science careers, clinical careers and research careers. And so thank you very much. And so I've been very focused on clinical research because I want to help our patients. Um, and I think COVID has taught us a lot of things about immunology really quickly. I feel like last year was like one really, really long day that never went away. And I feel like I haven't slept since 2019. And so... Yes, and so, but um, I think that one of the things we've shown is that Oklahomans really do respond when there's a crisis and we pull together and um, any investments in OMRF stay 100% in Oklahoma. And if you're interested in COVID screening, I have the number on there. I'm not gonna pull them out and stick everybody's finger in the hot because we might never, you might never be able to come back to the hotel. What can you say? And so I'll be happy to take any questions you might have in COVID or autoimmunity. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really that's a really insightful question. And so I will come up and ask him what your background is after this, right? Because most people never think about this piece. And so if I write a grant for a million dollars, right? It sounds like an insane amount of money, um, but it goes really quickly whenever I spread over five years and I'm paying a bunch of people. And so for every million dollars that I bring in, OMRF actually gets 750,000. And so, and that is to pay for all the buildings, to pay the rent on, I mean, pay for the bonds and pay for the animal facility and the um, clinics because our clinics don't make money because we see patients who need us no matter what. Um, and so there's a lot of pieces. It's actually a higher percentage than most of the other schools in Oklahoma, um, but we don't have any state funding because we're a private nonprofit completely focused on research. For those who are eligible, uh, what percentage of those who have died from COVID have been vaccinated? Yeah, so that's kind of a tough, so it's a good question. 
but it's a little bit of a tough question, right? Because the really what we need to know is how many people have been infected because it was still pretty hard in January because I got my parents' vaccines in January. And it, anyway, I sent them, I thought they could get them in Cherokee. I ended up sending them to Sayre which, you know, thankfully my dad knows somebody everywhere. And so, you know, he uses an excuse. Um, so I would say that everybody who wanted one could probably get one by March. And so by March, our numbers were starting to come down anyway. And so um, it looks like over, so the only numbers I know are from April, May, and those look like over 95% of people were unvaccinated. Who died? Yes, who died? Yes. Ah. Oh, so what in the world? So how many people know what Shingrix is? How many people have had their Shingrix vaccine? Uh, good. And so Shingrix is a shot that you take to try and keep you from getting shingles. It's actually, yeah. And so now there we go. We got more hands up. And so Shingrix is the newer one. Zostavax was the old one. Shingrix is really effective and it makes your arm really hurt for a long time after you get it. Okay. And so, um, because Shingrix is such a good shingles vaccine, it really revs your immune system up. And so one of the things we were trying in nursing homes before we had the vaccines, when we were having all of this doom and gloom from lots of places around the world, um, we were giving Shingrix vaccines to people who already needed them for shingles in the nursing homes and showing that we could rev up their whole immune system so that if they were infected, that potentially they would have milder disease. So we don't have the final word on that yet, but that was the kind of process behind it. Uh, so the Shingrix, so the Shingrix is kind of like tetanus. So tetanus is a fabulous vaccine. So you get your tetanus shot and it's good for 10 years. In most people, it's probably good. I shouldn't tell you guys this, 30, 40, 50 years, right? I mean, it is one of the best vaccines we've ever had. And then you have other vaccines like the anthrax vaccine that only the military gets that is a really, really crummy vaccine. And you've got to get it every year or you lose any protection you had from getting the vaccine, right? And so um, there are different vaccines that are kind of on different ends of that spectrum. And so we don't know for sure where COVID is going to fall in. Shingrix, though, we know is good for probably at least 10 years, and it may be even further than that. So we have a strong collaboration going with the Cherokee Nation, as well as with the Chickasaw Nations. You know, the Chickasaw were actually one of the groups that they get their vaccines completely separate. It's another reason that our numbers may always look falsely low is because Oklahoma state numbers don't have any of our tribal populations. And several of our large tribes have not just been giving vaccines to their enrolled tribal members, but to anybody that lives in their community. And so we're still trying to figure out how we can get those numbers into our numbers. And so in the Cherokee nation we know for example that they respond if you get the vaccine if you you're talking about the vaccine or the infection so the infection is worse and the mortality is higher and so like montana the data came out last week that if you were in montana if you were a tribal member you were about threefold more likely to get the infection but you were sixfold more likely to die and if you were a tribal member who died, your average age was 68. And if you were a Montanian, Montanian, that's a tough word. If you were uh, Mont from Montana, but white, then you, the average age was 82. So there's a huge difference. We think that it has something to do with, and I'm so sorry, I just now looked at the camera and I'm supposed to be summarizing the questions. And so this is, do Native Americans do worse with this infection? The answer is yes. And if, um, and I was giving the information about how different that is. And we think it has to do with their baseline immune response. And so we're working with the Cherokee Nation on that. Yes. Yes. So we know that Pfizer and Moderna have both done those studies, and those look very effective against the Delta version. We don't have as much data about the other vaccines. So like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, or then the newest vaccine that's probably going to get approval is from Novavax, and it's a lot like the flu shot. It's a, pro it's a protein-based vaccine. And there will probably be boosters this fall. Yeah, so I left my crystal ball at home. 
but the reality is, is you bring up a good point. And so I, depending on what our vaccination rate is and how long the immunity lasts, because even once your antibodies start to go down, there are other parts of your immune system that still appear to be effective. I think that there's no way we're gonna have 14 cases a day this fall. It's gonna be higher and it's gonna be like flu where we usually things are much better in the summertime and they get worse in the fall. So I anticipate we'll have another flare in the fall. I'm hoping that it won't be as deadly and I'm hoping it won't be nearly as large, but it depends on how many people we can get vaccinated. At the very back. Yeah, so the question is, what about the safety of the vaccine because it was rap rapidly developed? And so I tried to talk just a little bit about that um, because there is, um, it, it's not that we skipped any of the safety steps, it's that we were doing the steps in parallel, right? They were basically manufacturing something that may or may not have ever gotten approved. Um, and we may see that with some of the vaccines. Um, and they were doing research and development and putting it into patients as quickly as possible and getting safety data as qu quickly as possible. So it's not that we skipped any of the steps. Um, it's just that we were doing things so that we could try and get this out as quickly as possible. And so um, that doesn't bother me. I, I got vaccinated as soon as I could and I found vaccines for my family as quickly as I could. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, you know, for, so the question is, why did flu fall off the face of the earth during the pandemic? And so uh, that's a good question. And it's probably because number one, we basically were socially distancing from each other. Wearing masks was another big step. And everybody was hyper vigilant about, um, you know, hand sanitizer and washing your hands and doing all these things. And so there's a lot of question about will flu come back in the fall with a vengeance or will it still be a little bit milder than what we're expecting? And so I think that it will come back this fall, especially if we're open, just like um, we normally see it, but it may not be quite as severe because a lot of people have gotten used to wearing masks and some of our people who are really at higher risk for serious adverse, serious outcomes from flu uh, might do better if they wear a mask in the fall. And so, you know, that definitely Japan has a lot more people wearing masks now because they had bird flu a long time ago. We'll see what happens in the U.S. Mention vaccine hesitancy. Uh -huh. Do y'all have some research on that and possibly the top two or three reasons of hesitancy? <clears throat> So the question is vaccine hesitancy and what are the couple top three reasons for vaccine hesitancy? And so we have um, in collaboration actually led by somebody at the University of, of Oklahoma Health Science Center, which I didn't want to say that too loud in this room, right? And so, but that's the one in Oklahoma City, not the one because my dad, I was trying to say those are two different places. He's like, why didn't you become a vet? You should have been a vet. Anyway. <laughs> He says, there's still time, I could go back. <laughs> so, but vaccine hesitancy, it's different in different groups, right? And so I think that some people, um, and we're doing research and focus groups in places where we see really low, especially counties where we see really low case numbers. Um, the place that we're really focusing on is that college age kids seem to be much less likely to want to get vaccinated, um, partially because they're college age kids, right? They can jump off buildings and do all kinds of crazy things and never be hurt. And so they kind of have this conception that they'll never get sick. And so how do we encourage them to think about the other people around them and the fact that some people do get it and have heart involvement and have other kinds of involvement. So we're doing focus groups in different kind of demographics and in, in, in certain counties where we've seen a really slow uptake. The other thing is that even though you can get one anywhere, it's still not terribly convenient for some individuals. And so we're trying to find those so that we can address them, like having vaccine vans that go out to places and to different communities. And um, so it's a good point. And we're actually working on that in the state. Yes. Americans 
So the question is, we talked about Native Americans having poorer outcomes. And then the question is, what about African Americans? So African Americans and Hispanic individuals have both had higher rates. And the question is, if you start teasing things out, I know that because we've done this with the Cherokee Nation, that it's above and beyond the other risk factors we know about like increased weight and diabetes and hypertension and other things, right? And so there are definitely poorer outcomes in people who are African-American and Hispanic as well, but not as high as what we see in Native Americans. And so the question is, what about I had COVID, do I need a shot? And so I've actually had this discussion with multiple family members, right? And so whenever you've had COVID, you make an immune response to it, right? And, but then it starts to kind of get a little bit further. I mean, as you get farther out, it starts going down. And if you had a mild case, it goes down even faster. The great news is if you had COVID and then you get a vaccine, you make a great response, right? You make a fantastic response to the vaccine and there's no increased side effects in people who've been previously exposed and have antibodies and then get the vaccine. At the beginning, you know, when we didn't have enough vaccines for everybody, we were saying, well, maybe you could wait a few months. Um, and if you actively have COVID, we don't want you to now say, oh, wow, I should have gotten a vaccine and run out and get the vaccine. We want you to wait 30 days so you don't infect other people who are going to get their shots. Uh, but getting a shot after you've had the vaccine, I mean, getting the vaccine after you've had COVID is a good idea and protective. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We still do both rounds because we don't have any data if one shot would be enough. Right. And so the question is, so we've seen the messenger RNA vaccines can happen fast and can be more effective than I ever dreamed as an immunologist. Are we going to see it for other bugs? And the answer is yes. And they're already in development. And so, you know, there's cancer vaccines that have been working with the RNA based vaccines for quite some time. Um, but there's definitely ones that are in development for human disease. And they're even talking about using that as vaccine development for other species as well. So I don't think it's going to happen for this year, but I know they're already thinking about how could they possibly use it for the next year because, you know, they always base it on what's happening in Australia and sometimes they have to guess at what's happening in Australia. And so I think this may be a way for us to get a better vaccine much quicker. Wow, lots of great questions. Thank you, Dr. James. We appreciate